Good morning, everybody. We'll give a few minutes that everybody can Hi, Layla. Hi, Maya. Good. Do you want to start with your document first? Um, what we can, whatever you prefer. Yeah, I'll let you go ahead. Okay. Let's just, just wait for a moment or two for other people to join. Yeah. Okay, so Philip, can you start? Okay. Okay, so Shekhar is going to go through the document. Hi, everyone. What we wanted to add to this week is how to select a two-phase liquid. And two-phase liquid usually means the electric liquid. And with that, we wanted to bring kind of a selection, what to look at when you're looking for a dielectric liquid. So there is some specific parameters that should be looked at. And by that, I mean that uh, the liquid must be at the first point with low toxic, toxic mean non-toxic and non-flammable. Liquid that will be toxic or flammable based on our experience in the data center industry 
will not be accept, expect, accepted at all into a data center. So that would be the first point to look at. Second point is global environment. And that means ozone depletion, ozone depletion potential should be zero or very, very close to zero. Could be in the 0, 0.00 something, but it should be zero. That's the regulation today. And in global warming potential, we wrote here under five, but even under 10 is okay in the industry. This is the new generation of cooling liquids. All the generation were in the 300 and 500 global warming potential. But we're, when we're looking at the liquid now, it should be under 10 and even better if it's under five. If we're looking at the safety, and this is what I started with, then non-flammable and not toxic is a must. And this means A1 safety by ASHRAE. This would be uh, unacceptable to do anything else. And only now, after we selected all these, we're looking at the boiling point of the liquid. When it says boiling point, usually it means boiling point at atmospheric pressure or at sea level. And that doesn't mean that the system will use it at that temperature, but that is the base temperature at atmospheric pressure. And when we look at the liquid, because of the temperature, we want to bring it the case or the junction temperature. Then we look at a temperature between 10 to 40 degrees boiling temperature. And depending on the application means more of the immersion will go for 40, even for 50. And we will select probably something in the 20 that will give us a range of boiling temperatures of 30 to 50. And that depends on the chip, the GPU or CPU that we're cooling. The other part in this are nice to have, meaning usually a, a frozen, uh, freezing point, very, very low, meaning that you can ship the liquid inside the system and you do not need to dry out the system before shipping, even if it's air carried. There's another uh, topic that how the electric is the liquid. It's also a figure and I didn't put it here, but we can or important to know that the liquid has to be a very highly dielectric, more dielectric than air. That's what you expect from this kind of liquid. So if this liquid is poured on the board, it will not do any damage to the chips or to anything else. And from my point of view, those are the main topics. If there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Okay. Also, if anybody has additional information that thinks it should be added to this table or to this part of selection of fluids, I'll be happy to hear it from you. Does anyone review the document that we've posted on Google Drive so far?
Now, the next part is talking about material compatibility. When we're discussing material compatibility, these kind of liquids usually do not have uh, major problems with metallic, like aluminum, copper, brass, stainless steel, carbon steel. All those usually have no effect. The liquid doesn't have any effect on them. Where we do see uh, the, the challenge with these liquids in material compatibility is usually in the elastomer or the seals that are being used in a system. And what we see here is an example on a natural rubber, NBR, and all the, the materials that are used for sealing. Uh, this is an example that would, how they shrink in volume, in weight. And this is the way we check material compatibility of every material that we're using. I'm stopping here to see if anybody has any questions. Just to pull your attention, if you look at the table of the elastomers, then you can see that, for example, uh, NBR has grown in weight and lost in hardness. This is a material I would not use with this, the specific liquid that is in this example. Hey, Shahar, with, with this table, um, that's, I think, a great idea to have some some examples. Is there also additional guidance on, you know, what the threshold for percent weight change or volume change would be that, that would be cause for concern? How, how should you interpret, it, tr interpret this? Well, this is actually per customer or per user, and it depends really where that seal is in a... I would say in a figure of speech, in most cases, if the change is less than 5%, it usually will not create a leak. Mm -hmm. This would be a general statement. In some cases, it is more accurate and you need to make sure you're not more than 2%. But uh, what you'll see is that change, for example, in hardness, that it's like a, it could happen it looks like a dry out you won't have a leak unless something moves and then you will have a leak so for example mm -hmm. so i would say that as just take as a standard figure five percent is usually okay above that would not work but as i said in some cases you even need to be more accurate of course the less of changes the better the material is in the material compatibility so, right, good. Did you say NBR would not be acceptable for use? For this specific one, yeah. You see that it it gained fifteen percent in weight and lost thirteen percent in hardness. Do you think that that seems a little confusing since it's in an acceptable wetted materials list, but you're saying it's not accept it w should not be used. So perhaps there should be yeah. a footnote added. Yes, yeah. and this in, in this place we didn't even specify a specific liquid. This is just an example of a table of the compatibility. Yeah, so I, that's I guess maybe my point was to just emphasize the fact that this is one example in one very specific scenario. So it's it's on the customer to make sure they're testing with the specific fluid and, and the specific compounds because even within those generic. Um, elastomer compounds, there's, you know, there's a number of <laughs> different ways you can get to an NBR. Yeah, I would just uh, 
The danger is like saying APDM. A EPDM is a, not a specific material, it's a group of materials. Mm -hmm. So if you want to test them, you need to be uh, very specific on which EPDM you're testing, mm -hmm. for example. For table two in the metals, you've got weight loss is none. Is that realistic? I mean, you wouldn't even see a milligram weight loss or... Yes. None. Yes, this is very realistic. In yes. most of the liquids we have tested by today. Okay. Uh -huh. What's an acceptable weight change that can be passed? That 5% or less? I would... 5% is... 5% or, or less is good. Above 5% is a material I would not use. Okay. So that's a that's a cutoff. Yeah, but this is something that is a something that is, is internal decision here. Maybe somebody else can take it three percent or seven percent. It depends on on the use cases. Probably. We I can tell you that at five percent it doesn't leak in most cases. Hey, hey, Philip, what's the uh, test method you used for this? The way we test these is using sock sweat at 72 hours. That's a very simple test. I don't know if everybody is familiar, but if not, then look up sock sweat. It's a way of testing the these materials all the time with new purified liquid. We have found that if you just soak it in a, in a cup of liquid, that will not give you this uh, kind of uh, accelerated aging test that you would want to have. Is that an ASTM method that you guys used? Say it again? Is that an ASTM method? The sock slide extraction test? I'm not sure that I'm familiar, familiar with that, but I think yes. The answer would be yes. I'm not sure. All right. Thank you. It has to be looked at. That's something that we have found to be uh, the most, uh, the best way to accelerate the age, the, the, these uh, polymers, because if you just soak it, it would may give you different results that are not effective, because in two phase the liquid is purified all the time here boiling it and recooling it so just soaking it will not give you the same kind of results procedure uh so that called procedure or is a public procedure for elastomers Mike, can you mute the microphone? There's a lot of background noise. Thank you. Shaha, is that procedure, a uh, standard procedure published somewhere? The subject extraction test? Well, I'm not sure it is published. I think it is. This is something that we developed together with Parker as a procedure. And actually, 3M also were involved in the development of this test. We've tried different kind of testing. And this one gave us the most accurate and reliable results. So I'm not sure where it's published. I would say even the, the figure of 72 hours is specific, but uh, 
we found that the, there is rarely more. If you keep it more time, it won't change the results. So 72 hours sucks that after, uh, I would say, multiple months of testing, this is what we got to. Okay. And it's written here, the socks are tested in blue. Will the entire procedure be shared or is that kind of proprietary? It's right, shared right here in the document. It, it, okay, I can't read that fast. So all the details- no, It's okay, oh. but the document is released to everybody. Right, right. But if somebody wanted to do it, they could reference this document and they would know exactly how to do it, correct? Yes. Okay, perfect. If anybody reads it and sees something missing, then we'll be happy to add. But I think it it is inclusive. All right, I got a quick question on the metals testing you had. Yes. Um, you said you said you're um putting them at 100 C or something like that, and then the polymer is at room temp further down on the document. Is that a static test or is that with fluid velocity? on the next page down. You're probably you're relating to this two lines. Can you return your say ask your question again? Yeah, I was just wondering if you were paying attention to uh, erosion with fluid velocity in the metals and metal alloy tests. For this part of material compatibility, the answer is no. There's no velocity involved in this test. Thanks. Only.
Maybe something to say about leak detection. I'm not sure it's uh, in this exact proper, but all these liquids, when they leak and they almost evaporate immediately at room temperature. So usually it is very hard to detect visually. If you look at the place, you don't see like when water leaks, you have a little a drip that you will see. So the way to identify these leaks or location of a leak is using what is called a sniffer in the air conditioning industry. And with the sniffer, you can identify the exact location of the leak by pinpointing it uh, using this kind of a sniffer device. Uh, one thing on systems using these kind of liquids, they, they do not have corrosion or any biological growth in them. It's not like when you're using uh, water-based systems. So filtration is usually only for kind of large particles that have been released from anything it could be a piece of metal that has been from the manufacturing or anything like that that has been released later on. And the main reason to put filtration is to uh, save the life of the pumps. These kind of uh, systems usually do not have a problem with the cold plates themselves. If you put a filter of a 100 micron at out uh, between the buffer and the pumps, you're in good shape. This kind of filter also usually do not need maintenance because there's nothing to continuously collect from the system. It is very important from our experience to clean and flush the system very well before the first time you start using it. So all components need to be I would say completely clean from any scraps, from anything leftovers before they're connected into a closed loop and started using it in the cooling loop. I would say one thing about adding liquid and draining liquid, the, when you design a system, it is very important to have an, I would say entry and exit of liquid port that could be used when the system is operational. You don't need to stop the system to fill liquid. Usually you can fill it up with a pump and pump it out. Also when the system is working because you want to try and drain it as close as 100%. So just draining it from the buffer, for example, won't be enough. There's more liquid all over the system. So you'd want to drain it when the system is working. One additional point, to say in these kind of system that you're using a two-phase is also a non-condensed gases that are trapped inside the system. And if they're in a large quantity, it will affect the performance of the system. System like these should alert when they have a larger amount of non-condensed gases in them and have a port that will enable to free or release out those non-conventional gases. This uh, function is called purge, and purge is usually a function that you release the gases from a specific point in the system, and then you condense, try to condense those, so anything that would be condensed would be returned back to the system, and anything that would not be able to be condensed should be released to the atmosphere as being an air or anything else that is a non-part of the liquid you're using. So this procedure I'm talking about is important to make sure you're not releasing the liquid and vapor of the liquid into the atmosphere and not losing liquid at the, end, at the process.
I'll be happy to get any additional questions or highlight if anybody is interested to know more about anything in this document that we have passed through now. Johan, there's a monitoring parameter, the pressure, temperature recorded on the control panel. In our system, these pressure, these uh, parameters are recorded in the controller inside the CDU or what we call the HRU, the heat rejection unit, the unit that, that condenses the vapor into liquid. So vapor pressure and vapor temperature are the input from the servers. Liquid pressure and liquid temperature are the output from the HRU after the pumps. And the liquid level buffer that actually when you monitor, you can identify uh, if you have a leak and the reduction of liquid level. And by the way, the liquid level in the buffer does change dependence on the, the loading of the servers that you're cooling. When loading is reduced, the liquid level is also reduced because more liquid is in the system than going uh, boiling and going back to the buffer through the condenser. But those are the main the parameters main. of a system. Yeah. Somebody asked something? Of course, there's additional uh, parameters, but there are more on the environment, such as if you're using an air-based system, like air-assisted liquid cooling, then what is the air temperature coming in? If you're using water, what is the water flow and water temperature coming in to the condenser? Those are additional information that are not specific to the two-phase system. The voice. Okay. Okay. So, um, if you have any further questions, and also if you feel that there are more topics you would like us to include, so please let us know. And we also will be very happy if, um, if you will review the document. It's on the shared, um, on the shared, um, drive. So. You're more than welcome to do that. Yes, yeah, thank you. Nila and Shafa. So I highly encourage everybody go into the the Google Drive, look at the document and share your comment. So next I'm gonna uh bring up the water based coolant and uh, we'll go over the details. I, I Philip, this is Brown real quick. Um yeah. is this document on the on the wiki page? I see the cold plate based document. I mean the, the propylene glycol and the water base. I don't mm -hmm. see the dielectric document being attached on the wiki page. Mm -hmm. If you if, if you can just throw that in there as well for people to review it. I think I have that document.
So if you look at the shared drive, issue has three documents there all together. And if you go to the wiki page, I've seen all three documents are listed as well. Can everybody see that? So this uh, draft for wallet base, draft for PG base, and draft for dielectric. And if you click that, it will bring up the document right away. Oh, I see. I see. All right. Thanks for that. Yeah. Back to So can everybody see the word file I'm sharing now? Go back to shares. Okay, this basically is a document we published in 2022. I go over some editing. So basically people one, we would like to have everybody's input. I look at the file, there's uh, no editing or common edit. So just, let me just go over some point. I, I need everybody's input. So the operating temperature of the heat transfer fluid, we say it's not expected to exceed 60 degrees C or 150 degrees Fahrenheit. Is this a Acceptable range. Can everybody see a document? I'm going over right now. Yeah, yeah. Okay. From our experience, this is accepted. Okay. And the next one will be the table one. So we have set up the typical property for wallet-based tooling that need to be monitored all the time during startup, setup, and operation. So we have total suspended solid less than 5 ppm, total dissolved solid less than 1,000 ppm, and the connectivity. We set it up to be limited around 1,500 microsiemens per centimeter. When they start up, usually the coolant has less than 100 microsiemens, but as it start running, there's a chemical addition from biocide or additional coolant added. Usually there's a fluctuation, but we set it up to be 1,500 as a reasonable limit. Is this a... Uh, Acceptable limit for everybody? No objection? Okay, next corrosion byproduct. Since copper is a highly dominant metal in the system, so we set up the copper corrosion monitor, just monitor the copper iron as less than 0.2 ppm. Then there might be some metal from iron, but it's not likely. But we set it up to be less than 1 ppm. And this ore is, can be detected with the ICP or handheld test. It's easy test in the field, or you can send it to the water for laboratory to do the, the ICP detection. Any issue on this limit makes sense to add aluminum in there if people are using aluminum cold plates okay so what will be the aluminum limit you want to be i don't know but it just came to my mind that run into aluminum cold plates and i'm like ooh, should probably wash that too <laughs> so if you have aluminum Usually, you want to control a copper to be 
minimum. So any copper ion precipitate on the living surface will cause a galvanic corrosion. So most people do not like to have aluminum because uh, once you have copper and aluminum, they interact so fast. So I can put a limit, maybe less than 0 0.1 ppm. Sounds reasonable. I guess it's just in the, in the caveat if somebody was requiring or needed aluminum cold plates for some reason. Uh, and then you have all, you, like you said, there's tons of chemical compatibility problems with that if there's copper in the in the tubing at all and the wetted path. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Then come the pH control limit. So we set it up to be a wider range between A and 10.5. So A to 8.5 is actually very compatible with aluminum. But if you raise the pH to higher pH over nine, it will be <clears throat> corrosive for aluminum. But for copper and iron, it should be fine. So any coolant that has higher pH, if you have aluminum component, you might want to include some corrosion inhibitor for aluminum as a protection. Since pH at higher pH overnight will be aggressive against the aluminum surface. Total harness we set up to be less 30 ppm. Usually most people in treated water, they use the BI water. So there's no harness. The harness basically coming from either biocide or some corrosion inhibitor contribution. So the harness usually does not go up over 30 ppm. And turbidity, if it's a new coolant, usually the turbidity is between zero to five. Once you have biofouling, and that turbidity will go up. And most CPU coolant control panel doesn't monitor turbidity. So this might have to be monitored with a graph sample. The next one is the most critical for treated water, water-based coolant is the biofouling. So treated water is prone to biofouling. So we set it up the limit when you first fill the system to be less than one CFU per minute, the mill. Then when you run for extended period of time, we recommend like the bacteria should be less than a hundred CFU per mill. And any coolant that has over a thousand CFU, we recommend that there's a later section that the biocide addition should be implemented, just control biofouling. We have seen that if you don't control the biofouling at around 1,000 CFU, they can grow and proliferate up to 10 to the 6 and to the 7. And at that time, the micro channel in the cold plate might get biofouling plugage and uh, it will affect the heat transfer dramatically. For corrosion inhibitor, most people use the azo base, either polytriazole, benzotriazole for copper protection. And in the past, there's some composition, they use molybde for mild steel corrosion protection, but most of the cold plate components does not have a mild steel component, and plus molybde is prohibited in certain region. It's not allowed to discharge to sewer. So if you have molybdate based corrosion inhibitor, you might want to pay attention to discharge regulation. Nitride for mild steel protection is not recommended because it's prone to microbial degradation. There's a denitrifier can use a nitride converted to nitrate and ammonia. That will be a more issue with ammonia. And that will affect the copper 
corrosion. And there's some vendor use a silica based inhibitor for aluminum protection, but this inhibitor is prone to precipitate when you have a pH fluctuation. So if you have this corrosion inhibitor, you want to may, you might want to pay attention to the ability and also the active monitoring if you have issue that might pluck up the micro channel in the cold way. Dispersion polymer, it's not usually an issue. The, the wallet quality for the makeup, it's a DI wallet. Usually there's no scale potential since there's no calcium magnesium contribute from the coolant. Then the chloride, usually coming from other component, the corrosion inhibitor. So we set chloride to be 50 ppm for stainless steel component and 500 ppm for 316 stainless steel just to prevent the stress corrosion. So again, I encourage everybody go to document and you can actually edit and share your comment. It will get recorded on the file and we can bring it up for discussion. The next one will be section 4.4. <clears throat> oh, on the filtration, we in the original document said the citrine filtration recommendation to be less than five pp five micron, but in actual practice, we have found if you have citrine filtration down to one micron, almost at each cabinet level, so you might have to set up several citrine filtration. It can be hooked up with a quick disconnect tubing for each cabinet, and that will minimize the biopolymer. So that's why we actually recommend that a small micron size, one micron size stream filter to be implemented. Just just eliminate the biopolymer potential. And each CDU usually have an inline filter. Those are mesh filter. They range between 50 to 75 micron. It's was intended to filter out the large particle. It has no effect on biopower prevention at all. Any question on the filtration recommendation? Everybody agree so far? In quiet. So next action item I have is uh, on-site testing frequency. So once you start running the system, we recommend that the system should be test weekly, right at the startup for a month. And after that, we can have a monthly test. And if there's no issue with the coolant quality, then you can extend the testing frequency to accordingly. But usually for water-based coolant, it requires monthly tests. And since the coolant is subject to a lot of pressure different, and it's very difficult to pull the liquid out. So usually you can only pull out small amount like 10 mil or less without triggering the refill cycle. So usually you try to minimize the testing to be minimum and unless you want to run more advanced analysis, you don't really need to take a lot of liquid out of the system. So basically conductivity, pH, hardness, and total viable bacteria can be done within like 10 mil of the coolant. And these are the recommend, recommended tests. You can actually test for copper or test for azole. If you have aluminum, you want you might want to test for aluminum. 
So depend on how many tests you want to do as a routine on it, routine monitoring, you have to actually set up how much liquid you want to pull out. And if you pull out a little, little bit more, you might have to put in more coolant in the CDU. Any question on the testing frequency? Philip, the only question I have just because I'm intrigued is how often do you think you'd have to touch a water-based system to add additives to keep it in spec as a result of this testing? Like, is it normal to do monthly? Is it quarterly, yearly? Usually the vendor has automatic fee system. It's a storage tank for the coolant. It gets triggered automatically. And my experience, it will almost get triggered at least monthly. If there's no water loss, when they pull the liquid out for testing, it will trigger refill, but it will be small amount. But that's enough to boost the le levels or, I mean, yeah. like, okay. It's a pretty tight system. Usually the volume between 10 gallon to like 120 gallon, a small amount of loss can trigger the refill. Okay. So again, I would rec recommend everybody going to the Google Drive and review the document. We're trying to finish the document preparation by the end of this month. So we can actually submit to OCP for approval. So I really need everybody's input to finish this document. And if you need to set up separate review meeting, you can actually contact me directly with email. We can actually set up a one-to-one -one review session to go over some more detail if needed. Oh, uh, I have uh, one question. So all of uh, parameter could be on-site testing or some of item need uh, to sample testing on the party web? Yeah, all these tests I list here can be done with uh, on-site testing. And if you don't have the reagent, you can actually send it out for outside lab. But all this can be done with a uh, Handheld uh, colorimeter like the uh, the uh, nine hundred with the proper reagent, and you only need about between one to ten mil to run all the tests. Okay, got it. Thank you, Philip. Do you think it makes sense to give guidance, and perhaps you already do this, but like on how to do some of the testing, like what equipment you would recommend. Because if the, you can do it all with handheld, I think that's advantageous to those who aren't familiar with this testing. You know, like we do hardness with ICP, but that's kind of out of the question for a lot of people, but, and we do Azoles via ALSI, but if you have a handheld method, it'd be worthwhile to put in the document and any equi equipment you recommend or types of equipment. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I will do the. And then it might be good if there's ranges that you can put here, you know, yeah, they'll take the measurement, but do you have a range that is recommended to stay within so they know if it's like suitable for use or if it needs to be dosed? Yeah, that's range actually listed. Up above. One. Okay, so maybe yeah. just say refer to. Yeah, refer to table one for the yeah. Reason. Or it wouldn't put hurt to have it here as well. Okay.
do you have more input from your PG-25 document from Mark? We have a lot of work to do on that. We've got, uh, we've had some meetings. We have, I think we've got a follow-up meeting coming up um, to go over some final things before we update our document. We have, yeah, we've got, I sh hopefully by next, the next meeting, we'll be able to review some of that. But there's a lot of work that is happening and, and needs to happen on that. Yeah, we are on the final stretch, so I highly encourage everybody to review the three documents. We'll try to finish in the next two meetings so we can submit to OCP for final review and approval. Lida, you have any other question or request for the participant? Um. Same as you said, as I said before. So any input is more than welcome. Yeah, please reach out to myself, Keegan, and Lila. If you have questions and you want to set up a separate meeting to discuss in more detail, and please just review the document as much as you can so we can actually incorporate everybody's idea to finalize the document. Could you throw your email addresses for you and Keegan in the chat? I just looked at the front page of the open compute and they weren't there. Yeah, I'll do that. And I will send out the email with everybody, with our email, encourage everybody to have a separate conversation with us. Okay, thank you, Michael. So we're right on time. So I'm looking forward to our next meeting, try to finalize the all three document to be submitted for final approval. And thank you again for joining the meeting today. Looking forward to working with everybody to finish the document. Bahanu, you have any last comment before we wrap up? Uh, no, just, just one, the, um, the presentation material for the global summit that's due, um, uh, I think it's on 26. So yeah, yes. For, yeah. For folks to start working on that. Yeah. Keegan and Lila and myself will we'll work on that in the next two weeks, try to submit for the approval. Thank you for the reminder. Thank you, everybody, for calling in today. We'll see each other again on Zoom call in two weeks. Thanks, Philip. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.